Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Professor Brunge is here. It's uh, the 4th of April, which is Saturday afternoon. It's beautiful out. Hope you all had a chance to get outside. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk with you today about um, the coquette. <laughs> Good that I know what I'm talking about. Hannah Webster Foster's novel. Um, I'm just going to give you some background on the novel in the 18th century and um, some specifics about um, uh, how these novels were received, how they presented themselves, and then in a second talk I'll talk with you more specifically about this particular text. So we're spending our time for the next few days, uh, next week or so, talking about The Coquette. Um, it's one of the first American novels. Uh, there are two others that are earlier. There's Charlotte Temple by Susanna Rousen, uh, and The Power of Sympathy, which is written in 1789 by a guy named William Hill Brown. They're both earlier. Um, first thing, as always, read the introduction to the Norton, as I always encourage you to do. Um, it's good. It tells you a little bit about Foster's life, but it also gives you a little bit more of what I'm going to be talking with you about here, some background on, on novels and some context. Just a few highlights about um, Foster's life. She is another Massachusetts native, Go Bay State. <laughs> um, she has a, she's born in 1758. She gets a good education for either a woman or a man. Um, she marries a congregational minister. She has six children. Uh, while her kids are, are young, she starts to write. Uh, actually, before her children are born, before she's even married, she's writing for newspapers and magazines and then writes two novels while she has, has children, while she's married. Um, this one is published in 1797. Um, as I said, she wrote another novel, but we're not too interested in that one. Um, you can check out The Norton. It talks a little bit about that book. I have not read it. I feel a little badly about that. I should. So just to give you some background on novels in the United States. Um, so this is 1797. First American novels are written, you know, roughly 1790, about 10 years earlier. The English are writing novels, you know, in the 1740s. They've been writing novels for a long time. So why does it take so long for Americans to start writing novels? Um, so I'm going to give you about three reasons, um, maybe a little more. <laughs> um, so first of all, the novel is really a middle class form. It's, um, it's very appealing to middle class readers, the idea of a narrative, a story, as opposed to poetry, which is, you know, harder, harder for readers than is now. Um, it's more appealing, it's more accessible, and it's really good for a mass readership, for a big audience, some of whom are only partially literate, who are not particularly literate folks. And you ha have suddenly in these years a big rise in the number of middle class people in the United States. Um, and so there's an audience, there's a market, there are people to buy your books. Prior to that time, you write them, who's gonna buy them? Nobody, so there, now there's an audience, people are hungry for novels. That's the first reason. Second reason novels take a long time to take off in this country. Think about the reading of novels. It's something you do privately. You do it alone. It's not, it's not like reading a newspaper, which in the 18th century you would do in an inn with other folks around. You'd read parts of it aloud. You'd share it. Um, and when you think about the importance of community in the 18th century, um, and really going back to the beginning, the founding, um, well not founding, but, but the early days um, with the Puritans, think about all of Winthrop's body metaphors, you know, how we're all in this together. That tension between the individual and the community, as old as this country itself. But that um, idea that the community is very important is, um, is challenged by novel reading because it's something that you do by yourself. You don't do it in, in company of other people. Um, so, so that important American idea, which is also an enlightenment idea, Ben Franklin, think about how his ideas of virtue are very closely tied to uh, doing good for the whole community. Those are violated by novel reading because it's something you do and it's solitary. Um, so it's consumed in solitude, it's centered on personal ambitions and desires, um, and it's attracted, as the name indicates, novel, which means new, um, to unfamiliar experiences. Uh, the novel contributes to this sort of 
sense that the public space is, is being undermined, right? Um, and encourages this sort of, or at least the critics argue, it encourages this sort of self-seeking um, outlook, which really um, comes into full flower in the Jacksonian era in the 1820s. So there's a lot of hostility toward the novel. Um, those in power, the upper crust of the social hierarchy, ministers and such, really argue against novel reading. They, they see them as something that undermines the existing social order because it focuses on the individual um, and because the reader um, consumes the text by him or herself without any kind of interpretive guidance. Okay. Third reason, finally, perhaps most interestingly, at least to me as a reader, um, novels are often about women. Um, and they're often about women's lives. And they're popular with women. They're popular with men, too. Um, scholars have shown that everybody was reading novels. It wasn't, it wasn't just women. Um, but it's closely associated with women. And this is very threatening to the, to the powers that be, to the status quo. Um, women are repeatedly warned about too much novel reading. Um, and this occurs also in the pages of novels themselves, which is quite peculiar. So let's unpack that third reason a little bit. Um, why were novels considered so dangerous for women? Well, first of all, it, it is argued, it was argued at the time, that they were depicting um, sort of un raising unrealistic expectations, romantic expectations for women. Um, giving women unrealistic notions about marriage, um, about romance, and, and it, made, it would make them, reading too many novels, so the argument went, susceptible to the kind of seduction um, um, of unworthy or licentious men. So, number one, dangerous to your virtue. Second reason, reading is considered a leisure activity for the most part, something that would take one away from more meaningful work, right? Um, idle hands or tempted hands. Remember how nervous, how defensive Judith Sargent Murray is about um, saying that education is not going to take women away from their domestic labor. Um, the worry then is that too much education, too much novel reading is going to take women away from their domestic tasks. They're going to abandon their children, abandon their domestic responsibilities. And finally, um, as I just said before, people are commonly alone when they read novels. Um, and, and, and they're so imaginatively cut off from the world around them in their engagement with these printed texts, right? So if you already think that women are more feeble-minded um, than men intellectually, um, um, and if the novel encourages them to use their imaginations and remember how dangerous the imagination is in forever in, in American culture, um, the belief is that they can actually be harmed by reading novels that will actually impair them mentally, intellectually. So novels take a long time to get going in this country. Um, that's the first part of what I've been talking to you about, and one of the reasons is that they're appealing to women, um, and the resistance to novel reading on the part of women by powerful people is is very complicated and um, strong. So, as a result of all this suspicion around novel reading, all this anxiety around um, the dangers that it poses to women's virtues, really to women's minds, there's a lot of insistence in novels and by novelists um, on, on this statement that they're true, that they're literal, that they're not made up stories, um, that these are factual tales. Um, novelists, novel writers didn't want to be accused of, you know, whipping up these um, licentious stories to encourage the reader to enter into a fantasy world because that's too dangerous. They had to um, really insist on um, that these are texts that are virtuous and that they, um, they're didactic, that they teach you to be a better person. Um, and so this belief that a story had actually occurred, and I'm, I'm just retelling something that actually happened, um, you know, the belief was that that would make the reader take the moral of the story more to heart, all right? <laughs> um, we still do this, right? We, we like a true story, a true story. 
Um, but that sort of protection that, well, this actually happened, it's not the product of my fevered imagination, made the story safer and more virtuous. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Eliza Wharton um, and this particular text. She's taking on a whole lot of issues that are really important in the American Republic. Um, before we get to that, um, if you look at the title of this thing on page 843, The Coquette or The History of Eliza Wharton, a novel founded on fact by a lady of Massachusetts. So you see Wharton there um, tell, doing two important things. One, founded on fact. I'm not making it up. This is true. Really important. And also, I'm a lady. So I am a virtuous person. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you a virtuous, virtuous tale. Um, so, so she's and and Wharton did in fact base this story at least partly on a true story. Read the introduction in the Norton, and we'll tell you about that. Um, so, that's the background on the novel. That's the context in which um, a lot, um, the coquette is written. Um, Hannah Webster Foster. I think I called her Wharton. I'm sorry. Hannah Webster Foster writes writes this novel. I'm going to post again shortly another talk more specifically about this novel. Um, but in the meantime, get reading. Enjoy it. It's a good story. I hope you had a chance to get outside. Be well, stay safe, and I'll be in touch again soon with another talk. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your attention.